Hi everybody, welcome to class this week. Just uh, finishing up uh, the Essence True Eloquence course here with sort of a final class, just uh, going over some notes from Asian Classics Institute course number 15. And then I've got one more class just with some personal reflections before we do review, just uh, coming to you live from Hong Kong here. It's uh, very humid, hot and sweating, even in my room with air conditioning. So if uh, I look kind of like sweaty and gross and whatever, it's because of that. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> thanks for coming, and we'll just get started right now uh, with uh, our prayers. Let's get my reading glasses on here. Okay, starting with the uh, Heart Sutra. How much of perfection was in the Blessed Mother? Thus, I've heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgir and Mass Malchus Mount, the other great assembly of monks and nuns, and a great assembly of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. At that time, also, Supra of Alakshara, the Bodhisattva, the great beings, looking perfectly at the price of profound profession of wisdom, looking perfectly also at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence. Then, through the power of Buddha, Venerable Shari Putra sent to Supra of Alakshara over the Bodhisattva, the great being. How should a son of the lineage train who wishes to engage the price of profound profession of wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Supra of Alakshara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, replied to Venerable Shari Putra as follows. Shari Putra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage the price of profound profession of wisdom, should look perfectly like this. Subsequent looking perfectly and correctly also the five iris being empty of inherent existence. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, form is other, also not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Should I put you like this all phenomena are emptiness having no characteristics? They are not produced and do not cease. They are uh, no defilement, no separation from defilement, they have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, should I put you in emptiness there is no form. No feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tactile no object, no phenomena. There is no eye element, so forth, that no mentality element, but also up to no element of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance, no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there is no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no self of awareness, no attainment, also no non attainment. Therefore, Sherpa, because there's no attainment, bodhisattvas rely upon uh, and abide in the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Passing utterly on perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all the Buddhas reside perfectly in three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, making manifest complete Buddhism state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the equal to the equal mantra, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. Mantra of perfection wisdom is proclaimed. Tayatam gada gada paragada parsam gadi bodhi soha. Shari put your buddies have a great being, should train the profound perfection wisdom like this. Then the blessed one arose that concentration, said his perfection where the buddies have the great being that had spoken well. Go good, O son of the lineage, it's like that, since it's like that, just as you have revealed, and that way the profound perfection wisdom should be practiced, and the Tathagatas will also rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra, Spirit of Alushvara, the body of the great being, the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, devil gods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised what had been spoken by the Blessed One. Okay, so just take a moment just to um, <clears throat> relax and sort of get settled here for our meditation to say some prayers. And we can feel that we're in a wide open space, ground like lapis azuli. They're ourselves uh, surrounded by all sentient beings of six realms of samsara. We know that our mother is on our left, father on our right. People we love the most behind us as support, and people we like the least as objects of our compassion. Prayers and healing in front of us. So heading out from there, everybody we're close to, moving on to strangers. Human beings from all over the world, all different backgrounds and countries and cultures. The whole natural environment we call the animal realm. Just plants and animals, insects and so forth. Spirit world with all its different realms as well and life forms. Different planes and realities, celestial beings, gods and demigods. And countless beings in lower states of rebirth, hungry ghost beings and hell beings. And we're all here together meditating. Beautiful dome of a blue sky above us.
And we can see a vision of Dashita Pureland again in Pureland, Buddha of the uh, Buddha realm or Pureland of all the universal Buddhas. Shakyamuni Buddha, our Buddha teacher right now, Maitreya, Buddha of loving kindness, who's on his way, and so forth, as well as the Pureland of the Buddha of wisdom and Dashri. This beautiful, perfect paradise of a world. Think of all mountains, forests, lakes, and rivers, and so forth. Beautiful temples and shrines and everything with all holy beings, practicing, meditating, teaching, and so forth. In the middle of this is a beautiful central kind of cathedral. Inside the doors are open, we can look in. Is the future Buddha, Buddha Maitreya, Buddha of loving kindness, seated in a on a throne, like on a chair, about to descend and step into this world, be reborn in Bodh Gaya and sort of start to turn the wheel of Dharma, start a new form of Buddhism for all of us to learn. So the beautiful golden colored body, his hands are in the turn of the wheel of uh, Dharma Mudra, holding two white lotuses, where there's a crown, beautiful silks and so forth, jewelry. <clears throat> And we can feel on his right is the founder of the Okadampa tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, Adisha Deepankar Vajana, in the lotus position, wearing three robes of monk, yellow pen his hat, with the um, two and hands in the uh, <coughs> during the wheel of Dharma Mudra. In our writer, Maitreya's left, the founder of New Kadampa tradition, our tradition, Glupa tradition, Jay Sankapa. And we usually visualize him again in lotus position, three robes of a monk, yellow pen his hat holding two white lotuses at his heart with the turn of the wheel of Dharma uh, Mudra. Left lotus has the Prajnaparamita text and right lotus at his shoulder level there, they have a, has a flaming sword. Now my tray is heart from a beautiful gold and eternal knot symbol, kind of wonderful sort of fluffy white clouds. And on it again is Jason Cap in a lion throne, lotus moon sun seat, and his uh, two other uh, heart students, Chapagyatsu and Kedrupche, just in front of him, on lion throne, uh, lotus moon sun seats. And we usually visualize them, but his two heart students, of course, just have the teaching mudra with their uh, right hand and left hand is holding a dharma text in their lap, wearing three robes of a monk and yellow pandas cap. Taking refuge, I know Sinti means to achieve enlightenment, go for refuge to Buddha Dharma Sangha. I know Sinti means to achieve enlightenment, go for refuge to Buddha Dharma Sangha. Sinti means to achieve enlightenment, go for refuge to Buddha Dharma Sangha. Now generating bodhicitta through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Generally, four measurables of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free from misery. May no one ever be separated from their happiness. May everyone have equanimity, free from hatred and attachment. Okay. From the hearts of the protector, the hundreds of deities, a joyful land, <clears throat> under the beak of a cloud is like a cluster of fresh white curd. All known, no sin drop, the king of the Dharma. Please come to this place together with your chief disciples. In a space before me, lying from the and moon, when it was found to light, supreme field of merit from my mind of faith, please remain for a hundred hands to spread the teaching. So when we recite this, we can feel that sort of the clouds roll forth, kind of like a uh, furling uh, carpet or so forth, and rolling it, bringing uh, three gurus right in front of us, just in front and above us, kind of like a little crane being lowered to us. So when we look up, between them just in the sky and the clouds in front of us, and we sort of turn our head a little bit, we can see the clouds leading right back to Maitreya's heart. In uh, Kashita Pureland, Kashita Pureland is in front of us. It's almost like a huge harvest moon coming a super moon with the three gurus coming out of it here. 
Your minds of wisdom realizes the full extent of objects of knowledge. Your eloquent speech is the ear owner of the fortunate. Your beautiful bodies are ablaze with the glory of renown, and a prostrate to you whom to see, to hear, to remember is so meaningful. Pleasing water offerings, various flowers, sweet smelling incense, light scented water, and so forth. And a vast cloud of offerings, both set out and imagined, offer to you supreme beauty and merit. Whatever number achieves the body, speech, and mind, recumulates since time without beginning. Especially transgressions by three levels of vows. With great remorse, I declare each one from the depths of my heart. In this degenerate age, you so for much learning and accomplishment. Finally, it really concerns your major leisure and endowment meaningful. Protect her from the very depths of my heart, rejoice in the great wave of your deeds. From billowing clouds of wisdom and compassion, space you enlightened minds, a holy and venerable cruise. Please send on rain of vast and profound dharma, appropriate for the disciples of this world. May your vajra body, created from the purity of clear light, free the rising setting of cyclic existence, but visible the ordinary of your own and sun subtle physical form, stay unchanging without waiting till some star ends. Through the riches I've accumulated here, may the teachings and all of you receive every benefit, especially the essence of teachings of Lama Jason Kappa shine forever. Offering a beautiful mandala from our heart here, purified universe. <clears throat> The ground sprinkled with perfume and spread with flowers, the great mountain, four lands, sun and moon, seen as the Buddha land, and offered thus, may all beings enjoy such pure lands. Om and Guru Radha Mandala Tamirti Yami. Send forth this jewel mandala to you, precious gurus, precious teachers. Now I'm going to send this from the hearts of the three gurus here, and even from Maitreya and Pure land of uh, Dashida, or again in Pure land. Beautiful golden lights coming down, nectars too, but just feel just like light, like wonderful sunshine. Getting rid of all shadows and coldness and darkness. Having a warm sun at your face here. Really giving you blessing energy. Just feel that it's turning our more reactive mind into more positive, affirmative mind, opening us up. And if we're all constricted, tight and cold and kind of negative and whatever, it's just opening us up, making us feel very blissful and joyful, open-hearted and generous to everyone around us. Let's sing the big singing match here. Big me say way chen 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 raise me again pay wong po jam pao yam du pum alu jom say sang way dan dan chen ke pe sum kian song ka pa lo san dra pe sha bla so wa Make me say way to her chen chen raisy. Dream again, pay wang po jam pao yam. Do poon ma lu jom se sang way down. Where me can chen ke pay soon can song ka pa. Lo sang dra pe sha. Blasso, <laughs> Lo Sandra Pesha Blaso Wande. So beautiful blessing light coming down, making all of us glow, sort of golden glow. And now for the dissolution, let's just feel that we can sort of look inside our heart, inside our central channel and our heart chakra is a eight petaled white lotus, about the size of a dime or so, flat, and on it is a white moon disc. Oh, it just means it a pure energy or light. And we do the requests for the dis dissolution here. Horus and precious root guru, please come to lotus and moon seat at my 
crown. Great kindness, please remain with me, but still upon your blessings of my speech and mind. For your precious root group, please ascend the lowest means of my heart. And great kindness, please remain with me. Grant me the calm and supreme realizations. For your precious root group, please remain in the lowest of moons in my heart. Great kindness, remain with me. Please remain until you attain the essence of enlightenment. <clears throat> so with this, just feel that all Tashita Pyrlin starts to melt in a golden light, dissolve into Maitreya. Maitreya becomes like a beautiful sun, all the golden light sort of coming towards Jason Kappa, melting all the clouds, dissolves into Jason Kappa. His two heart students melt into golden light and dissolve into him. All the clouds, lion throne, lotus, moon, sun, seed, everything's all melted into him. So he's just him sort of floating in space, being at a pure energy in lotus position. Look, it just gets really, really small and tiny. Size of a sunflower seed. And he comes down to the crown of our head. Turns around to face the same direction we're facing. Enters our crown check and slowly descends to our heart. Right in the middle of the moon disc. And in the middle of the moon disc now, just feel that the lotus slowly closes and seals and melts into light. And you just feel great joy, great bliss, awakeness, luminosity and spaciousness here that we're sharing with all beings. me have a bit of a rundown here so um I'm a little bit jet lag so i have a bit of a cough i'm sorry <coughs> anyway just sort of coming out of meditation there trying to mean despite my cough trying to maintain a little bit of presence of awareness and open heartedness here and a blessing <coughs> and let's start with uh class here today <coughs> excuse me <coughs> So um, <clears throat> let's take a look at just finishing off the notes here for um, my notes for class 15. <clears throat> I think we already looked at what it means to sort of be, dis what it means to be discounting, what's discounted according to a middle way school, for instance. And then I think last time we talked about the two extremes according to the mind only school. You know, these being, for instance, believing that constructs could have a nature of existing by definition and that dependent uh, related things and emptiness don't have a nature of existing by definition. So we've, I think we've talked to that um, uh, before. <clears throat> so this is probably just going to be a little bit of a shorter class. I always say that we always run over an hour here, but um, just in terms of just finishing off my last um, few notes here, just before I go into sort of this um, bit, a bit of a summary for, my, for our next class. Okay, so uh, we talked about sort of a general outline of the mind only school. And again, um, <clears throat> uh, I just mentioned, I think, in the previous class, sort of the, the difference where the mind only school will say that the Majimika school, because it doesn't believe in existence by definition, that things truly exist by definition, um, that this is more of a nihilistic uh, view on things. They believe, for instance, that you know there is an existence to things, you know, that uh, you know, dependently arisen things 
you know, sort of the foundation for our conceptual mind in terms of the objective world, this thing does exist um, by definition, as well as the mind that's creating sort of the intermediary, the mediation through names and concepts, words, concepts, language, so forth. That exists, the lay of a jana, storehouse consciousness exists by definition, right? The only thing that doesn't exist by definition, in other words, on its own side, would be uh, our quote unquote constructs, words and thoughts, like I've said before, um, you know, words and thoughts, concepts, these kinds of things. They come from us, and so since that they're changing, they're relative, they, on, a, on a more substantial level, they don't reflect the world as it is in and of itself. It's more of our con construct, our creation, and so forth. So on one hand, they're fictitious in a, big, a bigger sense, but also on the other hand, we're responsible for them. And so that's uh, the mind-only school. Look at the Mandyamika. Uh, position and say, well, because you don't believe in inherent existence at all, everything's sort of free floating and doesn't exist. It's all like a giant hallucination. Whereas, like I mentioned, the Madhyamika school turns uh, mind only on its head and says that technically the problem with the mind only school, well, you're always going to have this big gap between what's considered to exist by definition, mind and world, what doesn't exist by definition, which is concepts. And there's always a question of how these things fit together. You know, I'm responsible for my constructs, you know, how I see the world, but at the same time, how this is tracking the world independent of my mind, how it fits onto the world uh, independent of my mind. That's an issue. One's true and one's false. <clears throat> what we look from the Mandyamika point of view is that everything, by not having a true existence at all, everything sort of ends up in a illusory level, but that's precisely why it, it, it's allowed to work, is we go from a position, almost a Kantian position of having sort of a transcendent world and an imminent world of our, our minds. We level all that off altogether in the Madhyamika thing. We just believe in an imminent system where things exist just by name alone, by names and concepts. And that's why we're able to create a world in the first place and that things are allowed to work as dependent arisings in the ultimate sense that things are ultimately dependent in terms of being labeled by the mind, being thought of by the mind, being talked about by the mind, right? So that's the difference. Um, yeah, so you have here, the mind's only, the, the, let's say an object, for instance, the pen, as Geshe Michael Roche always uses, the pen's emptiness is the fact that it doesn't have an absolute right to be a pen. It's a construct applied. It doesn't exist from its own side. It's just an arbitrary way of looking at the pen coming from karma. Okay, so I mentioned like the difference between um, deceptive reality. So if we looked at what can seems to be deceptive or a position of ignorance from a mind only perspective, constructs are de uh, deceptive reality because they're made up in the mind and don't exist by definition or from their own side. If something exists at all, it has to exist by definition and from a mind only point of view, that's mind and then dependent arising things outside or the basis for people's concepts, words and concepts. Whereas the Madhyamika uh, position is, uh, <clears throat> it's quote, not deceptive truth because it is not true, but it's a lie deceiving you. In other words, nominal reality. That reality which gets or deceives a deceived state of mind. Mind is deceived, not the reality. It only exists with reference to a deceived state of mind, the fact that things are not the way they appear. So this is a classic thing in the, the Madhyamika schools that things appear to exist substantially, appear to exist independent of the mind, but the point is that they're not. So that's why we call it truths for the obscured. Things exist like dreams or illusions. They seem to be um, fixed, coming from their own side, existing by definition, but the point is that they're not, right? They exist only in sort of a virtual way. So the Madhyamika is a deceived state, is a deceived uh, state about the object existing by definition but not mistaking think that the object exists at all. So things do exist, but they exist in a relative illusory way. Okay, so I might have mentioned it here, like what mind only, when we say mind only, but you know, the old sort of uh, more cartoon understanding of mind only school is that it's just sort of this strict uh, idealist per perspective is that there's no world outside the mind, things only exist by the mind, um, you know, sort of in a cartoon way. But it's actually closer to more of a Kantian way, you could say a river Hegelian way, in the sense that there is a world and there is a mind, but what's important is the mediation, our own concepts, words, and thoughts that mediate or structure how we see the world, 
right? So what we're engaged in, the filters that we're reacting to are coming from ourselves, not from the world itself. So it goes, mind only means physical causes are not the main causes of things. Mind mainly makes things. In other words, makes things as how they appear to us. What Hegel would say, the in itself, for itself. In other words, the truth of something, how something appears to us, is what it is for us, is how it appears to us, to our mind, how we're taking it, how we're translating it, how we're interpreting it, how it appears to us in terms of our concepts, our discriminations, our feelings, our likes and dislikes, and so forth. Number two, the world is not created by some kind of creator, God, or principle outside of the mind. Okay. It rather comes from our projections or constructs. And finally, everything is the same stuff. Physical matter, correct perception that grabs comes from the same seed. So we can see that just like I mentioned that the, um, the whole point of the mind only school is that, um, <clears throat> you know, what we perceive to be the object, how we put it together and the mind perceiving it come from the same karmic seed. So this ends up being accepted as being sort of a truism by the Madhyamika school as well. So it'd be the same thing I was, you, you, when we talk about, like, let's say when you talk, talk about in Kanti philosophy, transcendental idealism is what they call it. It is the threefold um, transcendental synthesis of the imagination. In other words, for instance, if you have a classic thing, oh, I've got my little chip book here. In other words, if I'm, Kant would say is that if I'm shown a series of perspectives, this side of the book and this side of the book, my imagination the fact that I can picture things, that things make sense. When I see this and see that, I see that they're part of the same object. They're, even though the perception's different, I know they're part of a whole. Because when I see this and this, what the mind does, the imagination, is it recalls this first thing and synthesizes it with this side. So I end up creating what you know, goes calls like X. In other words, out of a series of perspectives, I actually create what counts as an object for me. So this is uh, what he calls transcendental aesthetic in the sense that things have to appear in a whole grid, uh, sort of a conceptual map that things make sense to me at all. For instance, things have to be in time and space. Things have to be causal. They, they have to fit this whole matrix for them to make sense to me. So the world unfolds in terms of sort of a causal line, that there is a linear sense of time, that there is a you know beginning, middle, and end of things, for instance, that things are outlined in space. If that sort of whole conceptual apparatus or symbolic universe I live in, but this collapses, things don't make sense to me, right? Um, <clears throat> in other words, I'll give you an example. Uh, in uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, famous movie, The Shining, Christine and I always talk about that, is that um, the hotel is a psychic space that the overly, old, I can't remember, sort of the haunted hotel in the 1980 movie, The Shining, um, is a hotel where the physics of the hotel don't work in the sense that you have a sense of it like being like a square or something but then when you go here technically it's almost like there's another wing to the hotel but it shouldn't be there or you're going into one room but it seems like you're coming out another so Kubrick's doing that on purpose to show that this is a psychic space it's like a haunted space it's not a normal physical space so Kant would say is that things can't exist that way otherwise they don't make sense right in other words if i open up the door and walk outside but somehow i'm on the roof that wouldn't make sense to me right or is that if everything's upside down or that there's no causality you know um <clears throat> whatever i roll a ball but it actually instead of rolling it, it flies up in the air or something our world wouldn't make sense so the point is is that the world has to sort of exist a certain way for me so this is the same very similar thing in mind only school uh right but the point, uh, the difference in the mind only school is we say that things exist uh, by definition, sort of quote, truly exist, right? So the uh, storehouse consciousness for the karmic seeds, the Levachana or Kunshi in Tibetan, as well as dependently related things. Now, the point is, is that you get into all these problems. I don't want to get into it, but the Madhyamika critique is that if these things truly exist, then they have to exist by their own sign, then they can't interact. But if they can't actually be in a, in a relationship to one another, even in a logical way, which they have to be for this whole thing to work, this whole philosophy starts to fall apart, right? So even the idea that a lay of a janus storehouse consciousness doesn't have an object, this is the classic thing mind only says, is that, oh, if it's truly existing, it has to exist as separate from the world, but then you have a mind without an object, but a mind is defined in Buddhism 
as being a quote unquote object possessor. So you end up having almost like an infinite regress of the mind, right? Uh, you know, mind without an object, then what's it perceiving? It's perceiving itself. Well, then it's an infinite regress. What's it, you know, it's looking at itself. That's impossible. It's like a sword cutting itself or so forth. Anyway, there, I don't want to get into it, but the, I mean, you can look and read all the books on this, right? On this sort of Mikha critiques of the mind only school. Now, just quickly, the idea, I don't want to get into it too much, but the lower version of the Madhyamika, we can sort of split the Madhyamika Middle Way School into the Sotrantika Madhyamika and the Madhyamika Prasangika. So in other words, what they call the Autonomous Syllogism School and the uh, Middle Way Consequentialist School. So what you have in the, the, the Sotrantika School even splits into what they call the mind-only version of it, as well as the Sotrantika Svotantrika. Just to make it complicated, this sort of a, a academic jargon, right? So it basically, you know, one version of it will say that really everything's just a projection of the mind, almost like mind only, and then the other one will sit, just have more of a realist understanding, kind of like the lower sutric schools of Sotrantika or even the Abhidharma school, that basically the world just consists of you know energies, particles, flows. Whatever. But the point, what the, this uh, version of the Madhyamika school says is that uh, dependent arising things, you know, even the mind, do exist uh, by definition, but only in a conventional way. That when we look for them on an ultimate level of uh, analysis to try and find what their true self is, they don't exist, right? They're all dependent arisings, they're all empty. Right, so what does it mean to exist by definition for uh, a Sotantrika Madhyamika? Sotantrika sort of means autonomous uh, school, or uh, Robert Thurman calls it dogmatist, right? Why does it mean autonomous? Is that, in other words, for something to exist, basically that our labels, like a base for our labels, an object that we can cognize, um, so subject matter which we can talk about, this thing has to exist in some kind of public, a way that's independent of the mind or to exist at all, right? Otherwise, you're in this sort of, they would argue, kind of like this loose, groundless nominalism where you can say anything or do anything because um, there's no basis for anything. So it'd almost be like this sort of indiscriminate flow of continuity of nothing, just sort of a booming flux, so to speak. Now, there, it wouldn't make sense. So uh, the Satrantica school is that basically, how do I know something is this? What well, has to appear to me as in an, uh, an undisturbed state of mind, right? As to, uh, so it has to, to exist to be pairing from our, our state as a certain object, let's say it's a pen, and I have to be perceiving it with a clear sort of undisturbed, in other words, not mentally ill, not on drugs or anything, state of mind. So why is this important? Because in this lower uh, version of the middle way school, it's this idea that we're, why they say autonomous is that to make a syllogism, to be able to um, uh, refer to something publicly, like in a public world with others, in order that, that we're able to do that means that, some, that the world has to exist independently of our minds, at least on a relative basis, right? We're said that it truly exists on a conventional everyday basis. But the point is, once we actually start looking for it in terms of meditation, we see that on an ultimate level, it doesn't exist. So this would be the idea, um, you know, that I have to be able to, ref my propositions, um, you know, my intentionality of my mind, so to speak, the directedness of my mind, has to be directed to a truly existing object or a world that I'd be able to think about it or be able to talk about it in the first place. This is a long discussion, but this is... Tsongkhapa in his book says that this is the real breakthrough experience he saw by seeing the fallacy of this school. Because the point is even to be able to argue with someone logically, to be able to make a point of something, it's like they always say, like when we're making uh, predicate logic, syllogistic logic, we have to be able to have a subject to put predicates on, like the cat is black, predicate black, the subject is the cat. So the point is we have to agree on a truly existing thing outside of a mind, which is the cat. We both see it as the same thing in the public world, right? 
we're, I'm in Hong Kong, you're in Hong Kong, okay, whatever. This kind of thing, we're sharing this experience. Now, on a bigger point of view, we all know that it's relative and dependent rising and that it's not truly existent, but on a very sort of conventional everyday point of view, <clears throat> it has to be. Um, now, what Song Kappa said, this is his famous thing where he had that dream where he was stuck on this and then he dreamt that he was uh, present with the Buddha teaching and yet sort of these uh, famous Buddhist saints, Nagarjuna, Aryadeva, Buddha Palita and Chanakrit arguing amongst each other at this point. And then Buddha Palita was talking about the difference between the lower uh, Sotantric school of Nandimika and the higher middle way consequentialist school. And Buddha, he's like, oh my God, he's in the audience. I can't believe this is amazing. This is, uh, I'm getting, finally getting the answer to my question. I'm so confused. And Buddha Palita gets up from, you know, whatever, and then sort of hits Song Kappa over the head with his book. So when Jay Song Kappa gets up in the morning, pulls out of his book case, uh, Buddha Palita's book on Majumika philosophy, turns to the chapter on the, you know, Satrantica school, reads the entry, oh my God, there we go, ding, 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 he gets it. And he has a direct perception of emptiness, gets enlightened and so forth. So what is the breakthrough? Well, the breakthrough is when we actually give up this attachment to the idea of having an autonomous syllogism to the idea of having an object, right? So this is the classic, and we'll talk about the Wittgenstein, the idea of the beetle in the box, right? Um, that you get in philosophical investigations, <clears throat> or this idea that what would this public object, independent of our minds, look like? How would we be able to talk about it in the first place, right? If all we have is our sort of words and thoughts, words and concepts as a mediation. What does it mean to even try and claim that there's some basis to that that truly exists? How will we be able to get to it in the first place, right? And then again, this is, you know, Wittgenstein says it's like once we have the idea, he says it sort of divides through the beetle in the box is like he says, imagine a beetle box that uh, sort of kind of truly exists. This would be the object in our mind. <clears throat> and then no one can talk about it, like because everyone has their own beetle in their own box, so to speak, uh, that's unique and so forth. Uh, if ever, all we have is the same words that we're using, how would these words be able to reach this, um, you know, special little magical, special unique beetle that would be trapped in, in our little magical box that only we can see? What would that even, how would we even be able to talk about that or even share it with one another? The fact that we're discussing using the same concepts, using the same words, kind of in the same symbolic universe. What does it even mean to say that we have this special object that only we can see and only we can talk about and that other people, they would never be able to reach it. He says it sort of divides through like perfect division that this idea of this unique, truly existing object it, it doesn't make sense anyway, but it, it's left out of the picture altogether, divides all the way through. So it's the same thing with the Satrantica school, this idea that uh, the, the basis for our um, words and concepts, kind of for our label, has to truly exist. But on the big picture, it doesn't. How would that unique little kernel of reality be able to stand unrelated to everything else, right? It, it's if it's all related, then we have to get rid of it all together. It can't truly exist. It sort of divides all the way through. And that's why we sort of flip again, just like the same thing. We get rid of the idea of um, inherent existence altogether. The thing, anything exists from its own side, or in other words, outside of relationship to anything else. That That's the, the real emptiness that the middle way consequentialist school uh, has. So when you get to the Prasangika thing, what you really see is that <clears throat> there isn't anything like a shared, common, truly existing world that any of us live in, right? And that's why we can only talk about what they call middle way consequentialists is that all I can do is point out how you self-contradict in your own arguments. I can't posit anything truly existing. I just, all I show you is that you can't do that yourself. You can't yourself posit a truly existent, hey, we're all in this together, like kind of thing, like we're, you know, take this one object that we have all in common or something like that. Nothing is universal. Nothing is in, co in common. We're sort of a strict nominalism of individuals here in Nelson Goodman's uh, sense, so to speak. Um, so that's the big breakthrough. And why is that a big breakthrough? Because it 
puts you in um, a position where you're completely responsible for your own perceptions or completely sort of responsible for your own world that you live in almost on an existential level. Why is that important? Because it, rather than some, something being negative that we're sort of taking away something special, we're actually flattening everything out almost horizontally rather than vertically. In other words, this is special, this is truly existent. Separate from that, everything sort of flattens out. Everything's the same in terms of things being conventionalities and emptinesses, sort of the different kinds of emptiness and the big emptiness, capital E. Um, so this puts us in a position of absolute creation. In other words, what we think can come true. How we think and we talk about things is how they exist. So this is the thing that Heidegger says in Being in Time is that he says the proposition, uh, propositional logic is dependent on a more subtle primordial form of ontology. In other, in other words, he says that what you'll often get in modern logic or modern analytic philosophy is the idea that I have to be able to think or logically talk about an object in the world, that there has to be an intentional relationship between my mind and a specific object, and that I build the world up from that activity. But Heidegger says that even to talk about propositions, to talk about objects, even those words, even those concepts are part of language at a very, very more general level. You know, I'm using language and in a world before I go to university to learn that what logic is. So it's silly to turn it upside down and to say once I learn logic, well, this is what I've been doing all the time. Nothing worked before I went to university and got my PhD in logic. Now I know set theory. Oh my goodness, now the world works. He's like the world's always worked just fine without any of that stuff because it's just how you label things with the mind. Things are just uh, projections, literally. I mean, that's what the, the term Heidegger uses, the temporalization of language. It's the fact that language has tenses. I'm always doing things with it. I'm creating with it. I've got past, present, future. I have objects. I have states. I have uh, feelings. All these things. It's the whole symbolic world I live in by the language that I speak. The way I label things has created a world where even the idea of having a sentence, even the idea of having a grammar, even intellectually, how that's allowed to make sense in the first place. So that's why it's the consequentialist games that all we do is sort of get rid of the confusion or ignorance of trying to say things, taking positions, saying that this is truly existing, independent of my mind, independent of language, um, uh, independent uh, of anything, of any kind of relationship. I just show why that's false. I don't have to posit anything, any kind of metaphysical or ontological position. It's precisely that things are just rhetoric, so to speak, just the play of language that things are created in the first place. And again, why is that important? As we've always said, if things are, if all things exist as um, uh, merely labeled from your own side, uh, but this, this is the true meaning of dependent origination. So as we've said in the previous classes that we've done together, it's your karma is forcing you to project certain things based on your past or projections. So this is why living ethically is so critical. In other words, the world you live in is the world that you've created, not just in this life, from all past lives through the, you know, the way of labeling things. So the real goal of Buddhism, I have here as a note, is to stop our aging death by eliminating our ignorance. The whole point is to escape pain and constantly see things uh, in pause of life, what the real understanding of how things uh, work gives you the ability to sustain your behavior and ethics to the end, extra energy to keep your morality in a way no one else can. And this is the idea of the true meaning of the Heart Sutra, where emptiness is form and form is emptiness. Once I'm able to see this process, how I'm creating the world at each moment, creating myself, creating the symbolic world that I live in, through, in and through my projects, this allows me to really be ethical to create the conditions for pure Buddhahood by being absolutely pure, loving, and compassionate because I see everything depends on me that I'm doing it. I want to create the world that I really want to live in that's the best possible for myself and everybody else. And that's how I'm able to do this because I've, I've eliminated the central um, obstacle to pulling this off, which is my ignorance of this whole process. You know, the ignorance is in my own limitations my own misunderstandings of reality, thinking that reality is separate from my labeling of it, separate from my mind. Um, 
once I get rid of that kind of ignorance and quote unquote, wake up where I see that I am the world and the world is me, I'm ethically responsible for it and everybody in it. That's how I can have a mind of pure love and pure compassion and uh, really sort of activate or disclose, reveal my Buddha nature, the enlightened uh, nature of all things. Okay, so that's kind of like the whole point, <laughs> right? And a lot of ways, well, well, I'll sort of give uh, a little bit more of a summary and a conclusion in my next class here. <clears throat> a big takeaway from Essence of True Eloquence, but you can kind of see where we go from this. Of course, this is how our sutric path of philosophical understanding with Lam Rim instantly dovetails with our tantric practice of using our imagination to create the world at each moment into a Buddha universe rather than a samsaric universe to switch out my organic body and mind or my organic body of suffering, true suffering is the Four Noble Truths, so to speak, true sufferings and true origins to swap that out for a divine body of the true cessations and true paths, so to speak. Um, my mind, because it's just clear cognizing or as a tableau, it's a pure white page uh, an empty canvas that's nevertheless pregnant with all possibilities in terms of emptiness so I can rework it and create a new artwork of my life, create a new work of art. Right, this is a bad work of art. I want to create a new work of art, which is uh, an enlightened state. And I'm able to do this. And Tantra is my paint set. It is the yogic tools that allow me to create this uh, wonderful, beautiful work of art for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay, so there you go. Let's take a moment to dedicate this. And blessings of all holy beings, truth of karma, fiber pierce for intention, and all of our dharma wishes be fulfilled. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you next time.